And we are live. Hello. So, hello to Lisa Varshal Caron. Did I get it right? You did. Perfect. You know, I, I don't have any writers named uh, Jane Smith. <laughs> so It'd be you, too many. You told me the Varshal comes from Poland. Yes. And the Peron comes from? Uh, French Canadian. My husband's family. Um, he grew up in Vermont and they're French Canadian. Oh, well, I'm almost French Canadian. Oh, right. You lived in Canada, right? I grew up, I grew up in, grew up in, Utah, in Utah, which is au bord de Quebec. We can, part, we can speak in Francais if you want. Petit peu. Probably. Petit peu. Okay. <laughs> I, I, so I think we've just had the petit peu for today. Sounds good. <laughs> so, so Lisa, it's great to have you on the show. And um, my name is Mel Rosenberg, and I'm the host of the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network, which is so exciting. And uh, we are going to talk today about so many things. Your writing career, which is just about to soar and take flight. I hope so. Thank you. And you, you have a whole bundle of books coming out within the next few years. And I don't know whether I'm the first guy that gets to interview you. Yes. I mean, this is definitely this is my first um, recorded interview. I, I did a, a panel uh, last month with a group of authors, but this is my first individual interview. So it's very exciting. Yay. OK, so do you want to tell the audience how you got here, which is very unique? And don't be modest or I'll help you. <laughs> OK, sure. How I got here. So. I think there's there's kind of two answers to that in terms of my writing. Um, I've I'm one of those people who has always been into writing, um, in some form or another. As a kid, I was always jotting things in my notebooks and journals and writing plays and poems, um, and I continued that really throughout life. I got into a phase where I was writing songs. I know you're a musician as well. Um, for me, I was held back. I, I would write songs with guitar, but I was held back by the fact that I'm not a very good guitar player. So I would try, but the, the words came much more naturally to me than the music. Um, and then in terms of writing for children, I have two kids of my own. And I definitely became into picture books, as many people, when you're reading them to your children and just loving that experience of sitting with them and having, you know. Not, not, not when you were a five-year-old? Well, I definitely was into that then too. And I did write books in elementary school. I remember one was about Wilma the washing machine. Um, and uh, I, I enjoyed that very much and we would put them together with a stapler. Um, and then I would say I rekindled that love with my own kids. You, you rekindled that? That's a terrible, yes. pun. That's a terrible pun. <laughs> are, they, are they on Kindle? They're not on Kindle. So you didn't rekindle them, dear? I didn't, no. Okay, but, but I, I wanted to be more specific. This is very interesting, you know? It's like um, there's reader response theory and there's interview response theory where I ask one question, but I ask it in the wrong manner and then I get the different answer. Ah. So what I, what, I, what I wanted to ask you is how did you get on the show now? I'm going to help you. You won a prize out of 749 writers. Wow. Yes, that is how I got here today. Um, yes. Through Vivian Kirkfield's 50 Precious Words contest. Um, and Vivian is a fantastic part of the Kidlet community. She has been a wonderful mentor, support person for me, not an official mentor, just someone I see in that way. Um, and yes, I was, I was one of the prize winners for that. And I picked this interview. I thought it would be a really fun experience. So thank you. So thank you for picking me. <laughs> Well, thanks, I, I, Robert. I can't dream of being picked by anybody more suitable for being picked. <laughs> thanks. You're my best picker. <laughs> okay, so so you wrote a, a the, the the fifty precious words yeah. is based on Vivian's belief that you can write a story in fifty words. Correct. And I should mention that I love Vivian too, and she's been on the show. So Vivian Kerfield, wherever you are, sending you love. Uh, and hugs and kisses um, and um, so she she throws this contest um, on a completely voluntary basis and she finds all kinds of people um, who are either re ready to read 750 submissions or to provide a prize uh, which in my case I was honored to do and then people like you write 50 words so 
the 15 words that you wrote, which you're going to read in a moment. Okay. Um, did you prepare them specially or you just had them? That's a great question. So I did prepare them specially. Um, however, the entry for this year was actually one that I wrote last year. So I, I wrote something different this year and I just, it wasn't clicking. I said, oh, I don't really like this. And then I remembered <laughs> that I did her contest last year as well. And I'd written two entries last year. Um, and I said, you know, I kind of like the one I didn't submit last year. I, mean, I think I like that better than the one I wrote for this year, which I think is the, the moral of that as writers is don't ever throw your stuff away, right? I mean, luckily we do most of our stuff on computers now, so we, we have them accessible. Um, but, you know, revisit them. And just because you didn't decide to use them earlier doesn't mean they still don't have some value. Yeah. So your love for this story was rekindled, I <laughs> Yes. Um, so uh, now's the time to re read it to us sure. because, you know, it's already out there. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I've got that here. Um, it is called Wind and Water, and it's 48 words. Wind wakes water with a whisper. Good morning. Water ripples. Welcome, friend. Wind whooshes past. Time to play. Water splishes, splashes, rises, crashes. Time to rest, sighs wind. Water waves off the idea. I can't, you stirred me up. Wind howls with laughter. That's what friends are for. Beautiful. That's my story. Thank you. It's lovely. Thank you. And, and, and 48 words, you could have had another two. For, I could have had another two, but for the yeah, same for price. Sure. Exactly. I stuck with the 48. Um, water, water wishes. Um, so now let's talk about your life. So let's go back to um, what makes a young writer. So you were writing stories mm -hmm. when you were a child. Yeah. And, and today you are a um, psychotherapist. Correct. Uh, mm -hmm. Seeing children. So is this normal or abnormal for eight-year-olds to write their own children's books? Oh, I think it's actually quite normal. Uh, I mean, my kids um, write quite a bit. Um, one of my kids likes to write poetry. Actually, they both like to write some poetry. The other one really enjoys writing stories and reading. Um, I think that <clears> but, never... but, they're, but they're your kids. They're my kids, that's true. Um, but I will say they're not unique. They're not unique in that way. You know, I think we we gravitate towards stories, both as an escape from other things happening in the world. We gravitate towards stories to make sense of the world, um, just as a way to communicate things that are going on inside of us, um, to try to introduce a new idea. I think that, um, I think it's a pretty universal love for stories. Okay, but <clears throat> here we go. Um, you're, you're here with an amateur psychologist. Um, you said, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to escape. Mm, sometimes. Yeah. So let's talk about, I mean, I have this wonderful opportunity now to talk to you and you're a writer and you've been writing since you were a kid, but you're also a psychotherapist. And um, I've had many authors who, um, who wrote when they were children. But if it's normal, then that doesn't set them apart, nor does it set you apart. Mm. If that's what normal kids do. But the amateur psychologist like me will say, it's not normal to write books when you're eight years old. Um, and um, I want to know what were you escaping from, if you were escaping from anything? Wow, that's a deep question. Um, <laughs> you, you told me I could ask you yeah, anything. Yeah, I did say you could ask me anything. And, yeah, and I did. Yeah, um, you know, I think that Sometimes it's a pressure in the outside world, um, maybe to be a certain way or perform a certain way for other people. Um, and I think writing for me has always been, well, it's funny because now I'm writing <laughs> to put it out in the world. But prior to that, writing has been something that I felt like I did for myself in a way that was... Um, stepping away from the um, expectations that others might have, um, an artistic mm -hmm. outlet. 
And I do Lisa, think- Lisa, one right. second. You're not exactly answering the question, which is good. Hmm. Uh, what were you escaping from? You were escaping from expectations that people had? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think now in, in writing, when I say it can be an escape, I mean, a lot of things happening in the world that are, are very difficult to constantly be thinking about. And I think that, I mean, you know, I don't want to say that writing or reading is, is purely about that. I think it's so many different things. And I don't, definitely would never want to reduce either the reading experience or the writing experience to, to that. Um, and sometimes it's much more about actually interacting directly with things happening in the world. Um, but for me, to this day, when I write, even though I'm writing, thinking about publishing as well, I still write from that place of this is something that I do because I love it. This is something that I do because I don't have to be having this outpouring to doing things for other people. It's because it recharges me. And I still feel that way about it. So um, you're writing for you, for Lisa. Yes, yeah. And I think that's the best, the best way to write is to write for yourself and not for your children, grandchildren, parents, um, librarians, I don't know what. Mm -hmm. I think that we, we should all be writing for ourselves. Um, so that now brings me to the next question. Um, you could write to any age. You could write adult books. And I'm going to ask you now, why do you write picture books, even board books? Mm -hmm. Can I say that? Oops. <laughs> or for that. very young children. Yes. Um, so that is a great question. And it took me a while to realize that that was where I should be directing my focus. Um, so I actually had tried for years to write a novel. And I would start a novel and loosely based on or informed by uh, some family stories of my um, grandparents and great grandparents. I'd mentioned I have Polish, Polish and Lithuanian um, heritage and um, it's based on their story in, in Pennsylvania coal country. And it, wow. just, it, it wasn't clicking. And then when my daughter, one of my daughters was reading a middle grade novel, um, I actually have, I think the novel that inspired was this one, The War That Saved My Life by Kimberly Brubaker Bradley, which is historical fiction. And I read it and I said, my main character is 12. I should be writing this as a middle grade novel. And so I did. And once I realized that, I finished the novel. Um, and so I write middle grade also. Um, but that kind of got me into the Kidlet community. I joined, once I realized this, I joined SCBWI and started going to conferences. Um, I realized I had so many poems and I started submitting some poems. One second, we're, we're get, Lisa, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Okay. Um, what did you study in college? High school? I, mm, so I studied theater in college um, and I acted for a while in New York. And I realized, I, I enjoyed it, but I realized that for me, it wasn't a lifelong path. Um, and- what, what, When you say you acted in New York, what does that mean? It means I was in various- Broadway? Um, not Broadway. I was in an off-Broadway showcase and- Wow. Some other, yeah, and some other very small productions. Um, and I also danced and did some, some very low budget dance work. Um, so that was- And, and singing? Yeah, I, I, I sing. I wouldn't say I'm a, the, in terms of Broadway standards, um, the best, but I, I can carry a tune. Um, so yes, I, I, I did that for a while. And then I went back to grad school and decided I wanted to work with young people and, um, Became but, a, but when you decided to study social work and then do your mm -hmm. master's. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, this like hinting that you want to deal with children and um, you're writing for children. And I have this pet belief that people who write for children are children. Mm -hmm. So if you are writing for the child, Lisa, and you might not tell me why today, but next year you will definitely tell me. <laughs> uh, what age, Lisa, are you writing to? Mm. 
That's a great question. I mean, in picture books, I'm writing to probably the, yeah, the five to six year old Lisa. Um, and in middle grade, the, the Lisa of elementary to into middle school. So uh, it depends on what I'm writing. And I think with, but I'm also writing to the Lisa today that I still, I still love reading picture books. I mean, I, all of our books, these, this bookshelf is all kid lit stuff. And my kids and I both come and are picking stuff off to read. So I still love, re my husband makes fun of me because almost every novel I read is for kids, <laughs> young people. Um, it's, it's great literature. It's wonderful. My wife doesn't make fun of me because she writes poetry and literature too. So we can great. make fun of each other. Yeah. Um, so um, when you were a five-year-old, what, what were your favorite uh, picture books? Mm, as a five-year-old. That's a great question. Um, hmm. Well, so this may be strange, but there was a, a Sylvia Plath book that no, very few people know that Sylvia Plath wrote a children's book called The Bed Book. Um, and my mother had a copy. It is now very hard to get. I do have it somewhere. I don't know where it is on the shelves. Um, but it was written in rhyme. And it's about all these different kinds of beds. Um, it's a bed for cats, a bed for astronauts, a bed that, to, you, that has food coming out of it. Um, that was one of my all time favorite books to read as a kid. And the experience okay. of my mother reading it to us, I think was a big part of it also. Incredible. So do you write also in rhyme or you shy away from that? I do. I'm actually glad that you asked about that. Uh, so, you know, as I mentioned, I, I do consider myself a poet before really most other forms of writing. And I am a poet who likes rhyme. And my books are, my debut is in rhyme. Um, everything so far that I have sold is actually in rhyme. And I know- Yay, yay, yay for you, yay for you. Thank you, thank you. I, because I, I'm gonna share another theory now. Because, um, you know, I, I, I teach beginners uh, and I tell them, do not rhyme, do not rhyme, do not rhyme. It's not just the rhyme, it's the meter, it's the rhythm. Um, and it's almost impossible to get it right. And people are just waiting for you to fumble and stumble and tumble. And I, I'll continue. And then they say to me, um, yeah, but look at Julia Donaldson and the Gruffalo. Mm -hmm. And I actually met Julia Donaldson and she told me her life story. And she was a songwriter for the BBC. Mm. And that's how she broke into writing for children. So then I have this new theory that in order to write really good rhyme for kids, you have to be a songwriter and a musician. Well, Your comments. Mm. So, I, I mean, I, I do also write songs as I've mentioned. Um, I, you know, I think that maybe there is a musicality that a lot of poets have. So whether that's that they have had experience in music or they just naturally have that ear. And you're right that the meter is very important when you're writing in rhyme. Um, I think that sometimes writers get steered away from it thinking that editors don't like it, um, which isn't true. I mean, sure, there are some people out there who say they just don't like rhyme and that's I, fine. I, I, I'm with you. Editors don't like lousy rhythm and rhyme. Right. They don't like it when it's bad. But I think, yeah. you know, it's, I, when it's good, it's like it's like the Mother Goose, you know, right. when she was good, she was really, really good. And when yes. she was bad, she was horrid. And, and I think that <laughs> rhyme fits this category. Do you have any poems that you want to read to us? Oh, sure. Um, let's see. So I have I have a lot of poems in anthologies and magazines. And there's one that, I'll just do a, one that's a little bit longer. Um, this was one that was on, a, a, what do they call it? A sort of e-magazine. So there's a site called the Dirigible Balloon that is based in the UK. And they have poets from all over the world who, who submit. And what I like about their site is a lot of them have audio recordings with them too. And so you can hear this read by um, Jonathan Humble who, has this fantastic accent when he reads it. Um, 
but you'll get to hear me read it today. Uh, this is called The Magic. And this is a poem that I actually wrote a line of it years ago. And then it came together more recently um, in the form that it is now. Um, so it's called The Magic. I am the magic that swirls in the night, the shape of a shadow that slinks out of sight, the trouble that bubbles and builds to a boil, the steam as it creeps in a slithering coil. I am the creak of the branches that sway, the nudge of a breeze as it tugs you away, the circle of moonlight alone in the sky, the faraway howl, the footsteps nearby. I am the tiniest tickle of fear, the wisp of a whisper that itches your ear, the goosebump, the shiver, the chill in the air, the whiff of adventure, the taste of a dare. I am the darkness in which you delight. I am the magic of Halloween night. Wow. 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 Did you win prizes for that? Um, I didn't submit that anywhere for a prize, um, but- I, I, would, I would give you a prize for that. <laughs> Thank you. It's wonderful. Thank you. Um, and you know, a lot of the poetic techniques that, that are wonderful for poems are so great for picture books, right? When you have alliteration I, I, and- I was, I, I, and I was just thinking that. And, and um, one of the things that makes a picture book really sizzle is when the ending somehow comes back to the beginning uh, mm. when the surprise you know of, of Halloween night which makes everything kosher if you will because you're frightening the kid mm. and you're frightening the adult and you say what is Lisa doing here what kind of frightening poem is this <laughs> and then it turns out to be Halloween so, oh okay let's party mm. yeah yeah, and there is a way where I think as kids, you know, I, I've seen this in my own kids that sometimes engaging with that fear a little bit too can be really satisfying. And, you know, I will say as a psychotherapist that we also we grow from that, being able to face that a little bit. That's why holidays like Halloween have their place in, in a lot of um, places in the world. Because well, so are, are you saying the children should be reading the Pied Piper of Hamlin and uh, Hansel and Gretel and Cinderella? Oh, there's a reason why those those stories have power. Absolutely, absolutely, because it's letting yourself be afraid and knowing that at the same time you are safe. This is an incredible interview. We we <laughs> we, we should talk more. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, so Lisa, even though you've been writing children's books since the age of eight. Uh, Marsha's uh, marshmallow washing machine, um, and um, and poetry since high school. I'm guessing. Mm, yeah, at least since and, high school. Of time. And, and and still, you didn't study literature. You, you studied social work because you have a practical mm. side. Mm. Yeah, I'm, in terms of why I went into social work, I I really realized I like people first and foremost, and I like working with people and doing what I can to help people. And- um, but, but specifically young people. And specifically young people. Yeah, I, I do work with all ages now, um, but, but specifically young people, specifically um, the, that openness in childhood, including adolescence. I mean, I think that there's just, there's such a, an eagerness to, figure out the world, to figure out your place in the world, um, and to just to make sense of everything around us. Incredible. Kind of fascinating. So, so when did you, when did you feel that um, you could be a poet? Um, mm -hmm. at, at what age were you submitting and then getting poet, poetry published? Mm. That's a good question. I mean, I know I remember re winning a couple of local sort of poetry contests when I was in high school. Um, and then in college, I, I actually took a poetry class in college and the professor was really hard on me. Uh, it, it discouraged me for a while. She said something to me at the end of the class, like you've always been coddled and it's not my job to coddle you. 
I don't know that that's the best approach for a lot of people when it comes to <laughs> helping them improve. Um, it discouraged me for quite a while. And I think that I, I stopped sharing a lot of my work. Um, but I, it was around that time that I decided I would write things through song instead. And, and I, cause I felt that I could share that with people in the way that I heard it and the way that I wanted it to be presented. Um, and so I, you know, I would play at open mics and I would, uh, did some, I did some poems for friends, weddings and things like that, but I really didn't start submitting to any magazines or anthologies until a few years ago, right around the time that I started writing picture books in middle grade. You just ruined my theory. I, 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 I hate when fact ruins my theories. I'm just throwing that out, but I, it happens sometimes. How did so I ruin your theory? No, because I thought that, you, that your success was because you submitted your poetry and then you started submitting the stories. Mm, it was more simultaneous, yeah. It was simultaneous. Simultaneous yeah. is also good. So, um, so, so you, you've, you've been in this business for only a few years? Yes, I, would, I started my middle grade in, I think, 2018. And then it was around that time I joined SCBWI. Oy vey, how talented you are. Well, thank you. Well, for, most people take, I don't know, between 10 and 50 years if they ever break in. And you started in 2018. I, I will say- You're, I, you're a stellar success. Oh, thank you. I, I, I think the other thing is I, when I do something, I often pour myself into it. And I think a lot of people do in the Kidlet community, but you know, I, I really poured myself in, in terms of critique groups and contests and conferences. Um, and so I was doing it a lot um, rather than sort of dabbling. Yeah, but it was still, still with a day job. Yes. Yes, I mean, and, I mean and, and, and raising two babies. Yes, my babies now at least have school during the day. So I do have some flexibility there. And I set my own schedule because I have a private practice. And so I decide how I set up my schedule each week. You're like some kind time. of wonder woman. You probably also bake. I, I, I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, today is National Blueberry Cheesecake Day. Is it? I didn't yeah, know that. So you can run out after this uh, interview and uh, surprise your family. My 10-year-old is the baker in the family. I do more of the consuming of the baking, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so four years ago, so you joined everything. You joined SCBWI. You went, so at least uh, um, agents pick up only one out of a thousand writers. How did you get okay. to be that one out of a thousand? Hmm. Well, I think definitely luck is a big part of it. And what I mean by that is just the timing of when someone is looking. Um, I'll tell you, my querying journey was um, briefer than I expected because I was really focusing on querying my middle grade. Um, I had did maybe a handful of picture book queries. Um, as I mentioned, I do write quite a bit in rhyme. Not all of my picture books are rhyming, but you know, I think that some agents were are reluctant, even if even if they like the rhyme, they don't necessarily know if editors will. Um, and I thought maybe that's not the best thing for me to lead with. Um, and so, as I mentioned, doing various contests and um, conferences and things, very often you have the chance to submit to an editor or to an agent. So for my debut picture book, which is um, with Carol Hintz at, at Lerner Millbrook, I was able to submit to her through a conference. Um, I simultaneously had had a critique with another author who said, oh, I think this book would be really good for that imprint. And she had offered a referral as well. So I had both the conference connection and the referral there. Um, so I ended up actually getting an offer on the picture book while I was in the process of querying my middle grade novel. Now for the novel, I had the opportunity to submit to an agent at Aaron Murphy Literary. Aaron Murphy is usually closed to queries um, unless it's through a conference or a referral. And that particular agent 
she liked the work. She was swamped, didn't feel she could take anything on right then, but said, I think I have a colleague who would be interested. Um, and so at that time, it was right around then I said, oh, by the way, I just got an offer on this picture book as well. So it all kind of came together around the same time. Um, and then the colleague who she referred me to, we, we talked on the phone. She was lovely. She was energetic. I asked her how she feels about rhyme. And she said, I've sold lots of it. And I said, oh, she's my person. Um, and so it was, uh, it happened. It was very exciting. I, I was talking to, to another agent as well, who was lovely. Um, and I just, I felt really lucky that, that things came together the way they did. Okay. I think that in your case, it's, um, it's brilliance and creativity and, um, and hard work. Mm, hard work is because you, you, thing, yeah. like, you know, if you said, well, I was walking down the street and uh, somebody slipped on a banana and I helped her up and it was the editor for, uh, you know, Penguin Random House. And that's how I found my editor. I could say, <laughs> well, OK, maybe that was a little bit of luck involved. But you did all the right things. You know, I've been interviewed now 50 writers and they say all the things that we find it difficult to do which is go to a lot of conferences, um, be prepared to be rejected a zillion times, uh, mm -hmm. submit, um, submit to, to, to magazines, which we don't do, and we should. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're not, not the first to say that. Um, and how could you not have luck with given your, your talent? Um, and it's, this is a good time to mention your agent who's really done so well for you both. Yes, yes, Trisha, Trisha Lawrence at Erin Murphy Literary. Uh, she has so much energy. She is, she, she does so much. And the most exciting thing I think in finding an agent is someone who gets really passionate about your work and, and sees it the way that you want it to be seen. Um, it feels fantastic to feel that you have that partnership. So um, you've sold a, a I won't say how many books because I'm not allowed to. <laughs> not yet, yes. No, but I, I can show with my fingers, but I won't do that either. Um, but um, it, it, you're doing remarkably well. So uh, what percentage of these books are uh, board books, picture books, middle grade? What happened to your middle grade? Mm. Um, middle grade things are, are happening um, in progress, I'll say. There's, there's not really any news there, but... Um, and I'm writing other new middle grades as well. Um, but in terms of what's, what's forthcoming, I think I mentioned everything surprisingly so far is in rhyme and all but one are either nonfiction or informational fiction. Um, and what's interesting, you know, for the 50 Precious Words contest, the story I shared was, it was fiction, I, maybe in the informational fiction realm in that everything it was kind of true to the uh, way that wind and water would, would behave. Um, I do like sometimes personifying um, objects that, and you, know, you notice in the, the magic poem as well, right? There is something that I think kids really like about putting themselves in, in the shoes of inanimate objects or animals sometimes. Um, and you also hear sometimes don't anthropomorphize. Um, definitely in non the nonfiction world, historically, there were and still are some editors who do not want to see anthropomorphized animals um, uh, or objects. I think even some very strong nonfiction editors are shifting a little bit with that when they see the response that things are having in terms of sales. Um, but I understand some people feel that it confuses kids, particularly maybe if we're talking about animals, you know, what's real, what's not. Um, but I do like the shift toward being a little bit more open to that style. Oh, I think that anthropomorphized the animals are terrific. I mean, otherwise, how, how can you talk to them? Right. So how can they talk to each other? Yeah. Exactly. You know, I have stories about a snarky dog. I mean, how else, right? Um, so, but this is about you. This is this is terrific. Now we've come to the um, the pièce de résistance, which is your book, which is coming out next year. Yeah. Uh, can you can you talk about it a little bit? Uh, it's been announced. 
it's called uh, patterns or patterns patterns everywhere everywhere patterns everywhere yeah so a few a few words about that that's your debut sure it is yes yeah, very exciting um, i can talk about that that has been announced um patterns everywhere is with learner Mil milbrook milbrook press is the imprint at learner and it is going to be a photo illustrated picture book um, because it is about, it's, it's this sort of invitation to explore patterns in nature. Um, a lot of them are sort of these geological patterns. My husband is an earth and planetary scientist. And so some of the spreads are inspired by some of his research. And it is uh, written in rhyme with sidebars that are non-rhyming to give more information. And then there's some additional back matter as well. And when Carol asked me if I would be open to it being photo illustrated, it was just a gift because I said, oh my goodness, I was trying to picture how the illustrations would work for this. And I'm sure a fantastic illustrator could do it, but having the actual pictures, I think even adds to the, how awe-inspiring it is that these things just occur in our natural world. So for kids to be able to see that, I think gives it a, a coffee table book sort of feel for children. Well, what's the word count? Uh, oh, that's a great question. It's low. Um, my guess is the text itself is probably around 200. And then the sidebars would add to that. That's the other nice thing in writing and rhyme. You do keep your, your word count low. I don't get too fixated on that. I think that it's really the story that needs to be told that dictates how long it is. Um, but a lot of my books do run on the shorter side. Which is uh, something that editors like in picture books. Yeah, I think that right now, particularly in the US market, I have heard of some publishers internationally who like things a little bit longer and they in that they feel like, what, what are we paying for if we're getting a 175 word picture book? Um, but I think that the, the trend largely right now is for shorter, yes. Yes, uh, nobody wants to pay $1,000 a word these days. <laughs> um, okay, so um, this is terrific. I, I, my last question that I've been saving for you, uh, so I almost forgot it, is um, the moment the ideas arrive. Mm. There, I have this theory um, that uh, we don't really know where we get ideas from and we don't really know where they come from and how they arrive. Am I correct or wrong? I think that sometimes that's true. Sometimes an idea pops up and I just write it down and that, there it is. For me, sometimes it is a very specific moment, oftentimes being outside and being in nature um, mm -hmm. where there's an image that I notice, it, it, particularly for poems. I, I remember I was going to meet a friend for a walk and I saw these, these leaves that looked like yellow sequins. And I said, and I wrote a line about leaves like yellow sequins shimmer in the breeze. And the poem really just came from there. Um, I think with, with stories, for me, sometimes there is a line that starts the story, but often it's, it's a concept where, you know, a, Sometimes it has to do with something my husband's working on. And I say, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. That's so cool. <laughs> we have to write a book about that. Um, or somewhere else I'll hear or have a conversation and think that needs to be in a picture book. And you might hear people say that needs to be a book. Um, so I, I, occasionally, yes, there's that specific moment. But other times, as you're saying, you just, you have the idea, you, you start writing and then you figure out what it's about. Exactly. But you keep a notebook with you. Oftentimes I do have a notebook um, in the car or uh, generally not on walks, but uh, either I'll repeat a line. <laughs> I have been known to do that if I'm on a walk with my kids. I'll keep repeating a line so I don't forget it if it's for a poem. Um, or sometimes if I have my phone, I might do a voice memo or something like that. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, most of the people I've spoken to have at least one instance where they um, have this wonderful idea and they're in the car, they say, okay, I gotta remember this. Or in the middle of the night, they have an idea and say, oh, I don't have to write this down. I'll remember it, I'll remember it. Uh, and they get home and say, oh no, 
<laughs> yes. That that definitely happens at night, I think, to most authors. And you know, you always wonder, was it as good as you thought it was? <laughs> was it oh, that creepy it, it, It's it's never as good as you thought it was. But the, I think that what bothers us is that we don't know right. how, how good it was and also what it can riff into. Mm -hmm. So yes, of course, you, you know, we can remember when we started to think about, you know, a squash at the market. But when did it become Sophie squash? Mm -hmm. um, and um, this is, uh, and even sometimes when the people I'm interviewing think that they know, I would say though, there's some moment connecting your limbic system with your cognitive system uh, that you can't really anticipate. Anyway, I, I could be wrong. Um, I'm not a brain scientist. Um, is there anything that I haven't asked you about your remarkable career and you've just started? Anything you haven't asked me? Uh, well, I mean, one thing I think that I'll mention, just coming back to when I was talking about the idea of community, is how important I think it is in terms of conferences and critique groups, not to be doing that just because you're looking for an editor or an agent, but because the other writers are such a big part of this journey and this, and I think part of what makes it so fun. Um, I've met so many incredible people. You know, we were talking about Vivian and how great she is. I won a critique with her at one point, and it was actually for Patterns Every. I, well, I ended up submitting Patterns Everywhere for the critique that she gave me, and she gave me the confidence to send it out in the world. She said, "I wouldn't change anything. Sorry." <laughs> she said, "This isn't a very helpful critique because she. It was at that point I'd worked on it for long enough." Um, and I think those kinds of experiences of, of talking with writers who have been out there doing this longer and having critique partners who um, who push you on your work, but who also really like your work at the same time, um, that just really adds to the joy of this writing career. That's wonderful. Um, I cannot wait to interview you again. Um, I only hope that uh, when your book comes out next spring and I write to you and I say, uh, hi, it's Mel, and you'll write me back, uh, Mel who? <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah. So, so listen, um, this, is not, this is not luck. This is uh, the most uh, exciting combination of talent uh, that I have interviewed in months. Uh, Lisa, Varshal. Peron, it's been great to interview you. I'm so happy you're the one who won the 50 Precious Words Prize. Thank you again, Vivian Kirkfield, for pointing us in the same direction. And I cannot wait to see what you have up your sleeve. Thank you so much, Mel. I look forward to speaking with you again. That would be wonderful. Okay, I'm going to set it up already for next April. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you, Lisa. This is Mel Rosenberg who hosts the Children's Literature Channel for the New Books Network, signing off. Until next week, take care. And Elisa, it was wonderful. Thanks so much. Thank you. We'll, we'll take this offline at another time.